Alrighty, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today and welcome to the Environmental Law Institute's second session of summer school, all about NEPA, ESA, and the fundamentals of environmental law. My name is Sarah Viken and I'm the manager of educational programs here at ELI. We have a great program lined up for you today where we'll, we'll be hearing from experts on the National Environmental Policy Act and the Endangered Species Act. I want to take a moment to thank all of our speakers for being here with us to kick off our first virtual summer school session. Following the presentations from Jamie Plune, Rebecca Barho, and Katie Renshaw, we'll be taking questions from the audience. So please submit any questions that you have throughout the program using Zoom's Q&A function. We encourage you to use the chat for observations, comments, et cetera, but please be aware that we will be pulling discussion questions directly from that Q&A box. Today's webinar will be recorded and posted on the event webpage within a few business days. You can find the recording and register for future sessions of summer school at eli.org put this up super quick so you can see our schedule. Before we get started, I want to introduce our wonderful moderator. Guiding us through the next couple of hours will be Mindy Mead Myers, who is of counsel at Van Ness Feldman, Feldman in Washington, DC. Her practice focuses on regula federal regulatory law and policy as they pertain to natural resources, public lands, and native communities. She represents Alaska Native corporations, concessionaires, public lands, user groups, and others on regulatory compliance matters, corporate governance, and strategic business decisions related to land use, permitting, and economic development. Mindy's expertise includes wildlife and animal law, national park concessions, and litigation. She has expertise advocating for clients before federal courts, Congress, and administrative agencies in matters involving the Endangered Species Act, Animal Welfare Act, National Environmental Policy Act, Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, Alaska National Lands in, in, National Interest Lands Conservation Act, I'm sorry, and other natural resources statutes. Mindy is a graduate of Cornell University and George Mason University School of Law, and she's originally from Anchorage, Alaska. Thank you, Mindy, for facilitating today's program. And with that, I will turn it over to you to get us started. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you all for joining us this afternoon for ELI Summer School's first substantive session on the laws that make up the framework of environmental law in America. And today, our three panelists will introduce you all to two of the core components of environmental law in this country, the National Environmental Policy Act and the Endangered Species Act. Very briefly, the National Environmental Policy Act is a procedural statute that requires federal agencies to assess the environmental and related social and economic effects of proposed actions before taking major federal action affecting the environment. And the Endangered Species Act is intended to protect and recover threatened and endangered species and the habitats on which they depend. Our panelists will describe each of these statutes in more detail shortly, as well as some of the new regulatory developments related to their implementation. But I do want to offer the caveat that law students will spend entire semesters on each of these statutes, and actually everyone here on the call will spend our entire careers learning more about these statutes. So please consider today that we are just dipping our toes in, but we hope that you'll be inspired to learn more and to ask questions of our panelists later this afternoon. And please feel free to drop your questions in the chat as they come to you so they'll be fresh in your mind and we'll raise them at the end. So with that, I'd like to introduce our three panelists today. First, we will start with Jamie Plune, who will offer a NEPA 101. Jamie is an Associate Professor of Law and Interim Director of the Wallace Stenger Center for Land, Resources, and the Environment at the S.J. Quinney College of Law, University of Utah. She researches the implementation of environmental law and the practical problems that arise along the way. Her scholarship addresses agency decision-making, NEPA, permitting, public land management, climate change mitigation, and biodiversity preservation. She's testified before Congress and has written numerous law review articles. She completed a teaching fellowship at Georgetown University Law Center with the environmental section of the Institute for Public Representation and has also engaged in private practice as a litigator, ultimately becoming a shareholder at the law firm of Richards Brandt Miller Nelson. She graduated magna cum laude from Colorado College with a BA, received her JD, Order of the Coif, from the S.J. Quinney College of Law, University of Utah, and earned an LLM from Georgetown University Law Center. Next, we're gonna turn the discussion over to Rebecca Barho, who will provide an overview of the Endangered Species Act. Rebecca is a partner in Nossaman's Environment and Land Use Practice Group and is based in Nossaman's Austin office. Since 2006, Rebecca has represented a broad range of public and private clients, advising them on issues related to compliance with federal natural resource laws and permitting, 
conservation banking, and obtaining state and local environmental and other approvals. In the context of the Endangered Species Act specifically, Ms. Barho has assisted clients in obtaining permits, navigating consultation, and has both challenged and defended decisions made pursuant to the ESA. And finally, Katie Renshaw will offer the agency perspective on implementation of NEPA. Katie is the Chief of the Environmental Review and Coordination Section of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, Office of General Counsel. In that role, Katie serves as the NEPA coordinator for NOAA and supervises a team of attorneys and support staff who are responsible for developing and implementing, excuse me, developing and implementing NOAA's NEPA procedures, providing legal support for NOAA's implementation of NEPA and other cross-cutting legal mandates, and providing support for interagency and cross-NOAA engagement on infrastructure projects. Katie joined NOAA in 2010 as an attorney advisor in the Fisheries and Protected Resources section where she worked until her designation as NOAA's NEPA coordinator and the creation of the Environmental Review and Coordination Section in 2016. Katie also served as the Deputy Associate Director for Regulatory Policy at the White House Council on Environmental Quality from 2014 to 2015 on a detail assignment. Prior to joining NOAA, Katie worked as an Associate Attorney at Earth Justice in Washington, D.C., and as a law clerk to the Honorable Jan E. Dubois in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. She received her undergraduate degree from Carleton College and attended the New York University School of Law. So as you can see, we've got a great uh, line of lineup of panelists today to introduce us to NEPA in the ESA. And with that, I'm going to turn the mic over to Jamie. Thank you. It's really great to be here. I am honored to be among such uh, esteemed colleagues and also really honored to participate in um, ELI's summer school event. I'm a huge fan of the work that ELI does to contribute to the environmental law community. And I congratulate all of you uh, for participating in one of their flagship events and encourage you to stay involved as you continue your environmental law journey. Let's see if I can move forward. Today, we're going to talk about one element of the environmental law system, which is, well, two, but I'm going to talk about one, the Envi National Environmental Policy Act. I'm going to provide a quick overview. So here's what we'll cover. We'll talk a little bit about the birth of NEPA. We'll discuss NEPA's content contents in a big picture. As Mindy pointed out, most of us uh, continue to learn about NEPA and how it's implemented and how it works. But today we'll talk about this big picture. Uh, we'll talk about NEPA in action, and then we will do some myth NEPA myth busting. So the National Environmental Policy Act was passed by Congress in December of 1969, and it was signed into law by President Richard Nixon on January 1st, 1970. And it's often referred to as the Magna Carta of environmental law. And that's uh, there are a few reasons for that. One is that it was the first of a suite of environmental laws that we really think of as the bedrock of our environmental regulatory system today. So following um, NEPA, later that year, the Clean Air Act was passed. A couple of years later, in 1972, the Clean Water Act was passed. And then in 1973, the Endangered Species Act was passed. So you can see we had this watershed moment of environmental awareness that really began with the National Environmental Policy Act. We often refer to NEPA as a look before you leap law, and that's because its goal is to force agencies or the federal government to think about the environmental consequences of an action prior to taking action. It does not impose a substantive environmental mandate. It simply requires that the agencies consider the environmental effects. So we often say that there are twin aims, that they must consider the environmental effects and they must disclose those effects to the public. And that consideration includes a discussion of the environmental impacts, alternatives to the proposed action and mitigation. And as I said, we refer, it is a procedural requirement. It's not a substantive requirement. So even though adverse effects must be disclosed, a project can continue with a lesser environmental, um, the less environmentally friendly option if that's what the agency decides. 
So NEPA's procedural goals are really focused on transparency. The idea is that the goal was to infuse environmental considerations into every federal action. And so if you think about the structure, the intent is that if you combine transparency and disclosure with the opportunity for public engagement and an obligation to consider alternatives to an approach, including ways to mitigate potentially adverse effects, you will have better governmental decisions in the long run. And as we move from NEPA's birth to its current um, position in the world and in the law, it's notable to say that the nickname Magna Carta of environmental law really, um, really works internationally. The survey of the world's 197 jurisdictions revealed that at least 93% have adopted the EIA duty as part of their environmental governance system. So it really has become a model of um, many jurisdictions as they think about how to incorporate environmental considerations in government actions. Moreover, the UN General Assembly has recognized the right to a clean and healthy environment as a universal human right. And notably, the procedural elements of that right include the right of access to information, public participation in environmental assessments and decision making, and access to justice and effective remedies. So even with that, we see that the fundamental elements of NEPA are truly infused in international conceptions of environmental regulatory um, processes. So let's get on to what NEPA actually does. It starts with a statement of purpose. And so that statement of purpose says, this is what the act's going to do. And that is to declare a national policy, which will encourage productive and, enjo and enjoyable harmony between man and its environment, prevent or eliminate damage to the environment, enrich the understanding of ecological systems, and establish the Council on Environmental Quality. Now, the next section moves on to Congress's Declaration of Environmental Policy. And you can see here that it is quite an aspirational uh, declaration, and it's inspiring. Um, whether or not we live up to it all the time is a different question, but that's the point of policies is that you aspire towards something. So just to read off a few of the goals, uh, it is the continuing responsibility of the federal government to fulfill the responsibilities of each generation as a trustee for the environment and succeeding generations. Uh, also to assure for all Americans safe, healthful, productive, and aesthetically and culturally pleasing surroundings. Um, you can see there are several others. But I'm going to also point out one um, often ignored or forgotten about piece of the Declaration of Policy, which is that it uh, states, Congress recognizes that each person should enjoy a helpful environment and that each person has a responsibility to contribute to the preservation and enhancement of the environment. So it's quite an aspirational um, declaration of policy that really represents that moment in time when NEPA was passed and aspiring towards a um, more balanced approach to achieving economic prosperity while also protecting the environment. So beyond policy, what does it really do? Well, it established the Council on Environmental Quality, which is within the executive office of the president. It oversees NEPA implementation, so issues guidance and regulations and also uh, develops and recommends national policies for the president to promote environmental quality. And so the degree to which the CEQ is infused in government decisions really waxes and wanes depending on presidential priorities. And I'm going to let Katie talk a little bit more about what they do and what they have been doing, which are some really important and interesting developments in NEPA implementation. The next thing we'll talk about is what we for, refer to as NEPA's action forcing provision. So this is really where the rubber meets the road in terms of what does NEPA require. And the uh, statutory element is quite simple. It's basically that in every major federal action, the government 
that, sorry, in every major federal action significantly affecting the quality of the environment, the government will prepare a detailed statement on the environmental impact of the proposed action. And so you can imagine that in practice, this statement immediately begins to get parsed and we have lots of questions. What is a federal action? What is a major federal action? How do we know if an action significantly affects the quality of the environment? What exactly are environmental impacts? Uh, they include direct, indirect, cumulative impacts. So there are lots of legal questions that arise even from this one simple uh, statement or direction. It's also, um, oh, and the statute recent, some of those, um, some of those uh, questions have been clarified in regulations. And then more recently, some of those regulations and case law have been codified in recent amendments to NEPA. So one element of that is what must be included in an environmental impact statement. So there needs to be a discussion of reasonably foreseeable environmental effects, uh, envi reasonably foreseeable adverse environmental effects, a reasonable range of alternatives, the relationship between short-term uses of the man's environment and maintenance and enhancement of long-term productivity, as well as irreversible and irretrievable commitments of federal resources. Now, we often talk about NEPA's requirement by referring to the most rigorous element of the compliance requirement, which is an environmental impact statement. However, NEPA's analytical uh, requirements are actually scaled to the significance of a project's impacts. So uh, more complex projects have more rigorous analysis and less complex, less rigorous. So there are three different types of documents that may be prepared under NEPA. The first and the one that you've probably heard the most about is an environmental impact statement. And that is for every major federal action that significantly affects the environment. A less rigorous analysis is required for projects that it's uncertain whether their environmental effects are significant. And so that is an environmental assessment or an EA. And the uh, EA really just probes whether or not the proposed project will have a significant effect on the environment. If it does have a significant effect, the analysis will move on to completing a complete environmental impact statement. And if the effects are determined to be not significant, it will result in a finding of no significant impact, which we refer to as FONSI. And one important element of compliance with NEPA is that agencies or project proponents can reduce use mitigation measures to reduce the significance of the environmental impacts to a level that is not significant, and that is will result in the decision that we refer to as a mitigated Ponzi. And then finally, there is the um, least rigorous level of analysis, which is a categorical exclusion. And those are for actions that do not individually or cumulatively have a significant environmental effect on the environment. Usually, uh, categorical exclusions are defined by agencies through their regulations, but even these have to go through a minimal analysis to ensure that there are no extraordinary circumstances that would give rise to uh, potentially significant effects. Now, there is a quite distinct disconnect between discourse and practice. So what I'm showing here are two different graphs. Um, the first on the left is the number of uh, NEPA documents that are produced annually. Almost all NEPA documents that are produced are categorical exclusions. An estimated 1% of all NEPA documents are environmental impact statements, and an estimated 5% are environmental assessments. And I say estimated because there is no, other than environmental impact statements, there is no central database and there's no requirement for agencies to keep track of their NEPA decisions other than EISs. So there's a lot that we actually don't know about NEPA practice. However, almost all of the discourse about policy and particularly as you hear things about permit reform focuses on an environmental impact statement, the most rigorous level of compliance. And 
when you look at how many EISs are produced each year, that really indicates what a small amount we're uh, essentially letting the tail wag the dog when we focus only on EISs. There are less than 100 EISs produced each year, and only four federal agencies issue more than 10 per year. Uh, if we look at the Forest Services practice, which is one of the only agencies that does have a rigorous uh, database keeping track of all levels of analysis, we can really see here that they, on average, between 2004 and 2020, issued 54 EISs per year and 430 EAs and then 2,000 uh, categorical exclusions. So really, the largest amount of NEPA practice is something that we know very little about. A um, few other uh, discussion points. NEPA implementation is tiered. So we have the statute. Then we have regulations that are issued by the Council on Environmental Quality that further define the statutory requirements. Every federal agency issues its procedures, and then every bureau issues its own regulations and procedures. So if we're thinking about an agency like the Bureau of Land Management, their practice would be governed by the statute, the CEQ regulations, the Department of Interior regulations, and then also the uh, Bureau's own regulations. Um, further uh, refinement is provided through courts and case law, as well as federal legislation amending requirements of the um, NEPA, for example, with the recent amendments through the fiscal responsibility. So does NEPA work? If its goal is to have better decisions, the question is, does it work? Some people would say no, that it is the weapon of choice, a form of lawfare used by activists to manipulate the legal system and stop, delay, restrict, or impose additional costs on all types of federal actions. And some people would say, yes, it has provided the foundation for countless improvements in our environmental laws. It gives us cleaner air, cleaner water, and a safer and healthier environment. One challenge in parsing these two very different perspectives is that a lot of the opinions about NEPA are driven by anecdotes as opposed to evidence. In reality, as I mentioned, little is known about how NEPA functions. There's only minimal record keeping. As I said, their database is really focused on EISs, but not the other levels of compliance. There are different practices between agencies. And most importantly, NEPA's greatest goal is to mitigate risk or to avoid accidents, but the benefit of avoiding a bad thing happening is very invisible. So we are going to get into some quick myth busting as the last element of my um, presentation. The first myth is uh, really just more an accident or something that happens often in public discourse, which is to conflate permitting and NEPA. And this happens particularly in the permit reform, uh, permit reform discussions. So permitting and NEPA are not the same thing. NEPA is a procedure that's required and it often serves as a procedure um, procedural umbrella to analyze compliance with other substantive laws. So we have here a list of some of the other substantive uh, legal requirements that may, or sorry, substantive statutes that may require a project to obtain a permit. Um, and then NEPA provides a procedural umbe umbrella that often helps coordinate different statutory requirements. So there is no single permitting law. Uh, the complexity of the permitting process depends on the complexity of the project. Many projects could face multiple legal requirements. For example, they may require a Clean Air Act, a Clean Water Act permit, an Endangered Species Act permit, and several other substantive statutory laws. And secondly, I think it's valuable to remember that permitting is not red tape. Uh, permitting is the touch point to make sure that a proposed project complies with legal standards, safety standards, environmental standards. This is the way that we move from aspiration, like clean air, to implementation, actually having clean air. So permitting is really a very important function of government. I mentioned that NEPA serves as an umbrella, and there is evidence that NEPA's umbrella function actually improves decision-making times. So this was a study that was done. There was a circuit split on 
the implementation of the Endangered Species Act, whether or not critical habitat designations, which you'll learn more about later today, require a NEPA analysis. Uh, it was 18 years where this um, study took place. There were 643 designations. And what they found was that on average, the designations that went through the NEPA process were actually completed three months faster than the designations that skipped the NEPA process. So that function of gathering all of the evidence, placing it before the agencies, disclosing it, the structure that's provided by NEPA does appear to improve decision-making timelines. Myth number two, NEPA takes too long and wastes time. So the first question is, how long does NEPA really take? And the answer is, we actually don't really know. As I mentioned, we have there are three different levels of analysis, and most of the evidence that we have is focused only on environmental impact statements, but most of the decisions are some of those lower levels of regulatory analysis. But the other issue is that when we talk about how long NEPA takes, we're using single data points, and it really doesn't tell us very much about how NEPA functions. So the most common statistic that you'll hear is that it takes four and a half years to complete the NEPA process. That is for EISs, and that's from a CEQ study that was done um, between 2010 and 2017, and then later updated to 2018. So the average time to complete a NEPA process was four and a half years, but notably the median time was three and a half years. And as you can see, there were several um, EISs that were completed more quickly. There are a few complexities in this study that often are ignored. One of them is that it was across all federal agencies. And as you can see here, there's an enormous variation in the number of EISs completed by each agencies, as well as the amount of time that it took each agency to complete their EISs. And the second piece is really, I think, illustrated by, if you look at the far right-hand side, the Department of Transportation, uh, they did 185 EISs during the study period and took on average seven years. One problem with this study, though, is that there's no way to distinguish when uh, an analysis under the EIS starts and stops. And so transportation projects are great examples of projects that might start and stop for a variety of reasons. Maybe there's a loss in funding. Maybe the transportation project is highly controversial, and so it uh, waxes and wanes depending on political environment. These are all things that could stall the NEPA process, but it's not caused by NEPA's regulatory requirements. It's caused by external factors. I was part of a study that tried to understand more about uh, how NEPA operates, how long it takes, and what causes delays. Uh, we used data from the U.S. Forest Service. We had a database of 41,000 decisions. And what we found is that the length of time it takes to complete NEPA varies quite dramatically. This is a graph of all three levels of analysis. And as you can see, each level of analysis has a similarly shaped curve where the vast majority of decisions are made within a short period of time. And then there's a long tail where some projects, a small number, get bogged down. And so if we take all of that data and we put it, um, layer it on top of each other, and then we look at this four and a half year statistic, it really demonstrates that that number is not representative of NEPA practice. Most importantly, I think for policy considerations is that focusing on the four and a half year statistic ignores all of the evidence that a vast majority of decisions are made much faster and that tells us what is possible under the existing regulatory regime. So myth number three, eliminating the NEPA analysis is the only way to transition to renewable economy efficiently. And what we found is that uh, in our study, analytical rigor does not appear to be the sole cause of delay. Um, like running out of time, so I won't go into too much detail, but one fascinating thing that we observed looking at Forest Service decision-making times is that very frequently a less robust level of analysis what took longer than a more robust level of analysis. And this is quite interesting because the amount of rigor that's required in an EIS is very different than what's required in an EA, 
And yet, the fastest 25% of EISs were completed more quickly than the slowest 25% of EAs. And we saw that the same thing for CEs. And if it were analytical rigor that was driving delay, you would not expect to see this kind of overlap. So when we looked in um, more detail to try to understand, well, what does cause a project to delay? Why are we seeing such wide variation in decision-making times? We found that there are three main factors that often contribute to the delay, and those are agency capacity, so making sure that you have the, enough people to work on a project, and that the people you have have the right expertise to be able to get it done quickly and efficiently. Uh, some delays are caused by an operator, for example, a change in project uh, direction or change in economic circumstances, making the project less. Um, beneficial. And finally, compliance with other laws. So coordination between different agencies in complying with some of those substantive laws. So this is very important because it tells us that all of these drivers of delay are external to the NEPA process, and they can be addressed. Uh, addressing them provides different solutions than simply streamlining or getting rid of the NEPA analysis. And the final myth is that NEPA causes excessive litigation. So I really want to bear down on that. There is a lot of evidence that there's much less litigation than what's talked about. So one uh, uh, empirical analysis looked at the rate of litigation in NEPA, and less than 1% of all NEPA decisions are uh, that are made actually result in litigation, so about 0.22% of NEPA decisions are litigated. Um, looking specifically at renewable energy, a forthcoming article by David Edelman looked at uh, utility scale um, renewable energy projects between 2010 and 2021. There were 1,882 wind and solar projects during that time, and only 29 of them were challenged in litigation, 21 wind and eight solar. And uh, notably, those also really focused on um, specific localized uh, effects. So when you really bear down the degree to which uh, litigation is occurring, it's much more limited than the public discourse would suggest. So I want to close really quickly by reminding um, everyone that the purpose of NEPA, if we go back to its original purpose and the policy was to infuse environmental considerations in all federal actions. And the uh, so the goal of the statute is better decisions. And yet often what we use to judge the efficacy of the statute is time. And so I think it's helpful to remember that time is not the only relevant metric when we think about authorizing large projects with significant potential con consequences. A fast decision is not always a good decision. And I think it's helpful to remind ourselves of big accidents that we've had, like the BP um, oil well, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill that's pictured here on the right, which was authorized with a categorical exclusion, which was made very quickly. Disclosure is a time-worn and well-proven risk mitigation strategy. NEPA's disclosure requirements can coexist with fast, efficient, and thoughtful renewable energy build-out. And as I'm closing, I just want to say there are more resources supporting this uh, slideshow if you want to look at them. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Jamie. That was a really helpful overview of NEPA. So with that, we will uh, turn it over to Rebecca Barho, who will give us an intro into the Endangered Species Act. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm going to request control here. Um, thank you for having me today. Um, as Melinda noted, I'm going to cover the Endangered Species Act, um, and there will also be some nods uh, to NEPA because uh, that is part of uh, much of ESA permitting. So the, I'm Rebecca Barho, partner at Nossman here in Austin. Um, the Endangered Species Act was adopted in 1973, not long after NEPA. Um, I placed here where it's codified. It's administered by um, two agencies, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Marine Fisheries Service. 
those agencies um, administer the ESA for different species. The, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for terrestrial and freshwater species, um, while NIMPS is for marine and anadromous species. And then they jointly manage species that occur in both habitats. So today we're gonna to cover these sections of the ESA. Um, section four of the ESA relates to listing and critical habitat decisions. Section seven um, is about uh, interagency consultation for federal actions that affect listed species and critical habitat. Section nine is kind of the, really the teeth of the act. That is the prohibition on take uh, of endangered species. Section 10 um, refers to non-federal permitting. Uh, of, of incidental take. And then section 11 um, is about enforcement and citizen suits under the ESA. So starting with section four, um, what is protected under the act? Well, the ESA protects listed species. Listed species fall into two categories. An endangered species is one that is in, in danger of extinction throughout all or a significant portion of its range. While a threatened species is one that is likely to become endangered in the foreseeable future. Um, there are some limited protections for species that are not yet listed, but have been proposed for listing. And I'll touch on that um, here in a moment when we talk about consultation under section seven. So how do you get a species on the endangered species list? Well, the services, either US Fish and Wildlife Service or NIMS can propose a species um, on their own initiative. Um, they also are required by section four to respond to petitions for listing. Uh, so if you are an interested person and you would like to see a species placed on the endangered species list, um, you submit a petition to the relevant agency. And under the law, uh, the agency is required to the maximum extent practicable to make a preliminary 90 day finding as to whether or not the information presented in the petition um, may indicate that a species um, uh, should be listed. Um, after that 90-day finding, if it's a positive finding, uh, the services would have 12 months to make an ultimate determination as to whether listing is warranted, not warranted, or warranted but precluded by higher priority actions. If there's a positive 12-month finding on that listing petition, uh, then the agencies would then have 12 months to issue a final rule um, listing that species. Um, People can challenge uh, these various findings. Um, you can challenge a negative 90-day 90, 90 finding. In federal court, you can also challenge um, a negative 12-month finding uh, and even a not a warranted but precluded finding. Um, so those are often challenging courts, and we'll touch on that in a little while. Um, if you just kind of look around in the Federal Register, you poke around on um, the websites of various organizations who tend to bring these uh, petitions, you will see that petition deadlines are very frequently um, missed. And um, in fact, missing uh, missed deadlines are the source of many, many lawsuits under the Endangered Species Act uh, and often result in a settlement between the plaintiff and the relevant agency uh, with some required timelines um, for making those ultimate listing decisions. The listing process follows, um, is a public process, uh, requires public notice and comment, um, and uh, from time to time, things like critical habitat listings are um, subject to NEPA review. So what is an endangered versus threatened species? The difference between these two designations is how quickly the species uh, may become extinct. Um, in making that determination, the services will look at whether a species is endangered or threatened in a significant portion of its range. Um, interestingly, uh, until not that long ago, uh, the US Fish and Wildlife Service had a policy, a significant portion of its range policy, wherein if that agency looked at the species and saw that it was threatened across its entire range. It did not have to undertake an analysis as to whether or not it could be endangered throughout a significant portion of its range. Um, that policy was actually um, held unlawful by a federal court um, and uh, in connection with a lawsuit over the Northern Long-Eared Bat listing. And uh, we are expecting at some point uh, to see a new policy issued by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So the ESA does not prohibit take of threatened species. Um, instead, uh, 
uh, the service must issue a regulation, or I'm sorry, yes, the service must issue a regulation um, dealing with these threatened species. That's done under Section 4D. Um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for a long time had a blanket 4D rule that said any species listed as threatened would be subject to the full panoply of ESA prohibitions unless a species-specific rule was promulgated. Um, the National Marine Fisheries Service, on the other hand, has always issued species-specific rules. Um, in 2020, that blanket rule um, was rescinded, and the service, for some time, uh, issued species-specific rules just like NIMFs. Um, however, recently, uh, and uh, not that long ago, the blanket rule was reinstated, so we're back kind of to, to how things worked originally. Here's a picture of that northern long-eared bat. Uh, this species was originally listed as threatened uh, because the service found that it was threatened across its entire range. Um, and a court deemed that uh, that was improper and this species has now been listed as endangered. Okay, so what about plants? Uh, plants are also listed as threatened or endangered, but they are not subject to the take prohibition of section nine. There's some kind of specific considerations that you make uh, with respect to plants, primarily when you're dealing with uh, federal actions and then plants on state lands. Um, they are considered during the ESA Section 7 consultation process, um, which is really important to remember um, when you are needing uh, additional permitting, such as nationwide permitting under Section 404 um, of the Clean Water Act. Okay, so on this slide, I've listed the factors that the services will consider when determining whether or not a species should be listed as threatened or endangered. Uh, notably, the agencies are required to list species solely on the basis of the best available scientific and commercial information regarding their status. Um, they are not allowed to take into consideration the economic impact that could be considered or could be caused by listing of those species. Um, so as you see, the factors include present present or threatened destruction, modification, or curtailment of the species habitat or range, overutilization for commercial, recreational, scientific, or educational purposes, disease or predation, inadequacy of existing regulatory mechanisms, or other natural or man-made factors affecting the species' continued existence. Um, you know, right now we have seen, we seem to be seeing an increase in petitions seeking listing of species due to the, the impacts of climate change. Um, there have even been some petitions and in, in court cases about listing species um, based on the threat of climate change when those species aren't currently uh, under um, threat. Uh, for example, they're not experiencing a decline, they're not experiencing a reduction in habitat today. Um, but the petition indicates um, that they will in the future. And so for that reason, they are urging listing of these species. Um, a recent case would be one um, regarding the Western Joshua tree. Um, that species was petitioned for listing. Uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service declined to list it because they said it would be 50 or so years before any impacts um, might be seen. And that was too far out uh, to be reasonably foreseeable. Um, that decision was challenged and the service is now looking at that decision again. So listing factors for threatened species, um, as I mentioned, the services have to analyze whether they will become an endangered species within the reasonably foreseeable future. Uh, regulations tell us that the foreseeable future extends as far into the future as the services can make reasonably reliable predictions about the threats to the species and the species responses to those threats. Um, that analysis is done on a case-by-case -case basis using the best available science and taking into considerations um, things like the species life history and characteristics, threat projection timeframes and environmental variability. Uh, the services are not required to address the foreseeable future within a particular timeline or timeframe. Um, that is also done on a case-by-case -case basis. So delisting. Um, section four also deals with delisting species. Um, under that section, the services must delist a species when one or, one or more of the following delisting criteria are met. Um, and I've listed those here. The species is extinct. Um, the species has recovered to a point where it no longer meets the definition of a threatened or endangered species. 
Um, if new information available, you know, since the original listing decision indicates the listing species does not meet the definition of threatened or endangered species, um, or if new information is available since the original listing indicating the species does not actually meet the definition of a species. Uh, going back here for just a moment, I mentioned earlier that um, we see a lot of petitions for listing uh, species. We see, I would say, far fewer petitions for delisting species. Um, and even when we see petitions for delisting, in my experience, they tend to be less successful and than petitions for listing. Um, there is a, a decent example from not that long ago where a group petitioned the service to delist the American bearing beetle. Um, and uh, the service uh, originally was, was, was sued because they missed a, a deadline, a section four deadline. And ultimately the service and the petitioner came to a settlement agreement requiring the service to publish its findings. The service eventually uh, proposed and then finalized a rule to downlist the American bearing beetle from endangered to threatened. Um, and that decision was challenged by an ENGO and ultimately the service's decision was upheld. Um, so that species has now been downlisted from endangered to threatened. Okay, so what about critical habitat? <clears throat> Section four requires the service um, to uh, designate critical habitat at the time it lists a species as endangered or threatened um, to the extent that it can. Um, section three of the ESA defines critical, critical habitat to mean the specific areas within the geographical area occupied by the species at the time it is listed on which are found physical or biological features essential to conservation of the species and which may require special management considerations or protections, as well as areas outside the geographical area occupied by the species at the time it is listed upon a determination that those areas are essential to the conservation of the species. Critical habitat is designated through a rulemaking procedure similar to the listing process, um, but unlike the listing process, the services can uh, consider um, economic, national security factors, and certain other factors um, in deciding whether or not to designate critical habitat at all, or whether to designate specific areas from critical habitat. So that, that's a pretty important distinction from the listing determinations. Something that was in the news not that long ago um, was services designation of unoccupied critical habitat. That issue made, made its way all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, this case is Weyerhaeuser versus the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, this case uh, re revolved around an animal called the dusky gopher frog. Um, and the service designated uh, some critical habitat for the species in the state of Louisiana um, on land owned by a um, forest products company. And when the service designated that area's critical habitat, the area was designated as unoccupied critical habitat um, on the basis that even though the area couldn't support the dusky gopher frog at the time it was designated as critical habitat, the service believed that with some management actions, um, those areas could support the species. The landowners uh, challenged that designation indicating um, the area is not habitat for the species because it doesn't support the species and uh, indicating they had no intention to manage it um, so that it could become species habitat in the future. The Supreme Court ultimately held that unoccupied critical habitat must be habitat for the species in the first place. Um, the court declined to provide a definition of habitat, um, but the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service later adopted a definition of habitat in the context of critical habitat designations. Uh, and that rule was published in 2020. Um, ultimately, that rule, the habitat definition was withdrawn um, in 2022. Here's a picture of the dusky gopher frog. Okay, so what does it mean if you have critical habitat on your property? Um, well, Critical habitat really comes into play um, only in the context of interagency consultation under ESA Section 7. So if you're a non-federal entity on non-federal land with no federal permitting, funding, or authorization needed, um, then there really are no obligations, um, no, no affirmative obligations that you have regarding critical habitat. Um, however, 
Um, there are those who have um, posited that there is an economic stigma associated with designation of critical habitat on, on non-federal lands, and that also the existence of, of critical habitat on non-federal lands can increase the risk that a third party um, could challenge um, activities going on on that land. Um, so if you're on federal lands or you have a federal nexus, um, then section seven requires assessing whether that action would destroy or adversely modify critical habitat. Um, importantly, analyzing effects on critical habitat have to be done as a whole rather than on a unit by unit basis. Um, but this can get complicated and we'll come back um, to that when we uh, get to the section seven slides. Okay, once a species as, is listed, the service the services are required to conduct a review of the status of those species every five years. Um, as a result of those status spe uh, species status assessments, services can propose to change the listing status um, based on the review. They can propose to delist, uh, downlist, uplist, um, and of course they can um, allow the status to remain unchanged. Um, while the ESA requires those reviews to be done every five years, um, it, it just very rarely happens within that time frame. Um, an example here in Texas is the golden cheek warbler, um, which was first listed in the early to mid 1990s um, and only has one um, species review, five year review completed. Um, as I mentioned before, the ESA allows petitions for changes in status and um, critical habitat can also be challenged and uh, changed through similar rulemaking processes. Okay, on this slide, I've just provided some ways you can track listings, um, and this should also say delistings and critical habitat designations. Um, so the services are required to publish 90-day findings, 12-month findings, um, proposed rulemakings, and final rulemakings in the Federal Register. So um, you can definitely take a look um, there. Uh, the services also, or the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, maintains a listing work plan that provides um, a list of species and anticipated timings for certain species the service, is, the service is considering. It doesn't include all the species, but it does kind of give a decent estimate as to when we might see a listing decision on a, on a particular species. Um, the services both update their Office of Information and Regulatory Act um, unified agendas twice a year, and those will include anticipation, anticipated actions and timing, both on you know, listings, delistings, um, critical habitat designations, um, and lots of other things. Um, as you might guess, listing and, and delisting and critical habitat decisions are frequently litigated as our deadlines um, to these decisions. Um, and they can be invalid, invalidated if the services decisions um, are found to violate um, the Administrative Procedure Act, um, you know, which is, you know, they have to not be arbitrary and capricious. And if they're found to have not um, examined the statutory listing factors or uh, critical habitat designation factors. Um, another place you can look at to see what kinds of listings might be on the horizon, um, you can check newsrooms of various ENGOs who tend to be active. Um, Center for Biological Diversity is one, Wild Earth Guardians is another, um, Xerxes Society um, has an interest in pollinators, so you can check those websites as well to see what may be on the horizon. So here I've just put a couple of species, maybe four species that have wide ranging geographic uh, ranges. Um, the monarch butterfly, uh, we are expecting a listing decision uh, for that species at some point this year. Um, there are several bumblebee species, the American bumblebee, the Western bumblebee, that we expect to see a, a, a listing decision this year. And then the tricolored bat and little brown bat, we should see um, fairly soon. Um, together, these species cover essentially the entire United States. Um, and we don't know yet what the service will do. Um, actually, with tricolored bat, it's been proposed as endangered. Um, we haven't seen a final rule. Okay, moving on to section nine. Section nine uh, of the ESA prohibits take of uh, endangered species. Uh, take says that it's unlawful for any person to take endangered species of fish or wildlife within the United States or its seas. So take is defined by the act as to harass, harm, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, kill, trap, capture, or collect, or attempt to engage in any such conduct. 
Um, importantly, the term harm is not defined by the Endangered Species Act, um, but was defined by regulation as an act which actually kills or injures wildlife and may include significant habitat modification or degradation that actually kills or injures wildlife by significantly impairing essential behavioral patterns, including breeding, feeding, or sheltering. When this definition was um, adopted, um, it was challenged um, by a group of landowners and, and that challenge ultimately went up all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, the plaintiffs were landowners dependent on the forestry services uh, industry. And they, they challenged the rule saying that this rule would essentially prevent them from utilizing their land um, because their land was habitat for the Northern uh, Spotted Owl, which was threatened and for the red cockaded woodpecker, which was um, endangered. Um, so they made a facial challenge to the rule saying that the definition of take in the ESA essentially assumes that you would be having kind of a direct purposeful um, impact to a listed species. The Supreme Court, however, um, using a Chevron deference, um, said, no, this is a reasonable interpretation of the word harm. Um, but the Supreme Court said not all habitat modification is going to rise to the level of being harm um, or take. Instead, only that which is foresee which will foreseeably cause actual death or injury to a member, an identifiable member of a protected species. Over time, this has been really a fairly high burden um, to prove. Um, a case not that long ago out of Texas, there was um, a challenge to the state of Texas's um, kind of water rights program. Uh, there, the plaintiff said, you know, the, the way that you are allowing users of water um, to draw from um, rivers in Texas was ultimately causing desalinization um, of these important estuaries down on the Texas coast, which were habitat for blue crabs. And blue crabs were an important part of the whooping cranes diet um, during here when they're here on their wintering grounds. Ultimately, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeal said, yeah, that's too long of a causal chain. Um, you know, you can't really have that many links in a causal chain to say that particular action uh, is causing take. So, you know, a lot of people will say in order to violate uh, the harm provision, you really have to have, you know, a dead body. And while I don't think that's necessarily true, it is quite a, a high burden to prove. Okay, moving on to Section 7 consultation. Section 7 requires agencies uh, to ensure their actions will not jeopardize listed species or result in the destruction or adverse modification of designated critical habitat. Um, so a federal action is permitting, funding, um, or other authorizations. Um, and you know, this can include rights of way on federal lands, um, getting verification under a nationwide permit where species, listed species or critical habitat are in the vicinity or might be affected by that activity, um, receiving federal funding, um, and even applying for an Endangered Species Act Section 10 permit um, is a federal action subject to Section 7 consultation. And I'll touch on that in a moment. Um, so the agency undertaking the action or approving the authorization or right of way or permit is considered the action agency for Section 7 purposes. Um, if there's an underlying project proponent or applicant, um, then that project proponent will support the action agency often by preparing or providing um, a biological assessment or biological evaluation to inform the consultation process. So what is jeopardized the continued existence of? Um, the definition is, is made in, uh, in Section 3 of the Endangered Species Act, but it's to engage in an action that reasonably we would be expected directly or indirectly to reduce appreciably the likelihood of both the survival and the recovery of a listed species in the wild by reducing the reproduction, number, or distribution of that species. Destruction or adverse modification of critical habitat is direct or indirect alteration that appreciably it diminishes the value of that critical habitat as a whole uh, for the conservation of a listed species. Section seven consultation process can be uh, formal or informal um, and ultimately can conclude that there's no effect to a species, that there is an effect, but it will not, not likely adversely affect a species, 
um, that uh, the effects will likely adversely affect a species or that the effects will actually jeopardize the species or adversely modify critical habitat. Um, with respect to the actual process, a no effect determination um, is made by the action agency itself. And if the action agency concludes that there is no effect of its action on listed species, um, there is no obligation to do anything more. There's no obligation to um, receive concurrence from the US Fish and Wildlife Service or NIMS. Um, the, the consultation process is, is over at that point. If the action agency determines that its action may affect, but is not likely to adversely affect a listed species, um, then the action agency is required to obtain concurrence from the relevant resource agency. Um, so for example, with respect to the US Fish and Wildlife Service, if the US Fish and Wildlife Service concurs that yes, your action may affect, but is not likely to adversely affect a listed species or critical habitat, um, it provides that concurrence in writing. That's an informal consultation, the process is over. Um, if, however, this, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service doesn't concur and that not likely to adversely affect determination, or if the action agency um, on its own says, yes, my action is likely to adversely affect a listed species, then they must shift into a formal consultation process. Consultation time frame is, uh, by statute, 135 days, kind of, sort of. Um, the action agency actually has 180 days to prepare a biological assessment um, that describes the impacts that a given action will have on a species. Once the relevant resource agency receives that biological assessment, the agencies have 90 days to complete um, their consultation, their formal consultation process, and then the service would have 45 days to issue a biological opinion uh, with its findings. That deadline, um, very frequently is missed. Um, and typically the service will ask for the action agency and any project proponents um, permission to extend that time frame. And I'm sorry, I didn't move the slide, but here's all of the information that I said. Um, if in the context of a formal consultation, um, the agencies anticipate that there will be take of listed species in connection with the action, then in addition to issuing the biological opinion, the, the service would also issue an incidental take statement. Um, that incidental take statement would um, authorize any take um, that would occur in connection with that federal action and would also set forth certain reasonable and prudent measures um, that the agency believes are necessary to minimize the impacts of that take. Um, just a note for hard to detect species, the burden to quantify take um, as like a number of individuals um, can be challenging um, and even quite expensive. Um, the Fourth Circuit has invalidated biological opinions for pipelines and other things um, because they did not believe that quantification of take of the of listed bat species was sufficient. Um, this is also true with respect to things like karst invertebrate species, where you might be able to find that there is one in a cave that they, you don't have any way to establish an actual um, you know, population number. Um, so this can be challenging. Um, prior to some regulations that were finalized just a couple of months ago, um, the services could not require compensatory mitigation um, as part of the Section 7 process. They could only um, require reasonable and prudent measures um, aimed at minimizing impacts. Um, under the services' new Section 7 regulations, however, um, compensatory mitigation can properly be part of um, the reasonable, reasonable and prudent measures set forth in an incidental take statement. So if the Section 7 consultation um, results in a finding by the services that an action will actually jeopardize a listed species or destroy or adversely modify critical habitat, the biological opinion will provide reasonable and prudent alternatives to the action um, that would avoid um, this result. RPAs must be implemented in a manner consistent with the underlying purpose of the action under review. They have to be implemented consistent with the scope of agency authority and jurisdiction and must be technologically and economically feasible. 
Um, if the action agency could, will select one of the alternatives identified, um, then an ITS can be issued. Rarely, however, um, the services will find that there are no RPAs um, that would avoid jeopardy. Um, so now we're just going to talk very briefly about a circumstance where this happened. Um, and this was with respect to the Tennessee Valley Authority's Teleco Dam. This was a project that in the 1970s cost around 116 million. Today, it would be nearly half a million dollars. Construction had been ongoing beginning in 1967. Um, and then when the project was about 95% complete, a scientist found this rare fish, the snail darter, um, that was, had been listed as endangered um, the same year as the Endangered Species Act um, was adopted. And um, the services found that completing the dam would drive the fish to extinction. So because the ESA forbids actions that would jeopardize endangered species, there was a project opponent that sued to halt construction of the dam. Um, a lower court issued a permanent injunction against completing the dam, and the Supreme Court ultimately agreed and said the ESA prohibits this action from moving forward if, if it will cause the extinction of the species. Um, ultimately, Congress reacted by creating uh, what we call sometimes the God Squad uh, in 1978. They amended the, Congress amended the ESA <clears throat> so that there were, under certain circumstances, a way to exempt a specific project from the requirements of the act. That amendment created a special committee uh, of various cabinet level members and at least one member from uh, this, the project's state. The committee can exempt a project from the requirements of Section 7 um, under when it makes certain findings, and I've listed those here. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, this is sometimes called the God Squad or the God Committee, but because of the potential that exempting a project from the ESA could mean the extinction of an entire species. Um, just, just a note here, um, after this lawsuit, um, the dam was completed, um, but scientists and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service undertook um, some activities to collect the snail darter from below the dam, move it into a couple of rivers in, in Tennessee, and then over time, um, some additional conservation measures were taken, and in 2022, the snail darter was, snail darter was actually delisted um, based on recovery. So um, under Section 7, um, while you're undertaking consultation, um, there could be no irretrievable commitment of resources. Um, this could, you know, essentially means um, anything that could extirpate a species um, or jeopardize a species or destroy or adversely modify critical habitat. Um, this, this requirement is triggered by a may affect call. Uh, and once it's triggered, you have to be really careful about the kinds of activities that you undertake while you're awaiting the completion of consultation. Uh, very briefly, the Section 7 regulations were updated uh, effective May 6th. Again, um, they codify the service's ability to require compensatory mitigation. Um, it actually adopts um, a mitigation hierarchy that you must first avoid um, impacts and then minimize any impacts that remain after that, and then mitigate for any impacts that remain after avoidance and mitigation. Um, from a, a regulatory perspective, as somebody who deals a lot with um, project proponents, it helpfully did retain a 60-day limitation on the completion of informal consultation, which had previously been adopted for the first time in 2020. That's been a really helpful provision. Um, section 10, um, and I'll try to speed things up. Section 10, incidental take permits and habitat conservation plans. Um, if you are a non-federal entity uh, and you've identified a risk of take for your project, um, you can apply for an incidental take permit. Um, applying for a permit is completely voluntary. Again, the only obligation that a non-federal entity or non-federal project has with respect to the Endangered Species Act is not to violate the take prohibition. Um, if you apply for an incidental take permit, you have to submit with your application a habitat conservation plan that meets the criteria, issuance criteria of Section 10. Um, these permits can be project specific, um, and then there are a lot of programmatic or um, you know, kind of landscape scale um, incidental take permits that have been adopted and function on kind of a certificate of inclusion or enrollment um, basis. So the standard for ITP issuance is that the take must be incidental to 
otherwise lawful activities. The applicant um, has to prepare an HCP that commits to minimize and mitigate the impacts of the take to the maximum extent practicable. The applicant has to ensure that there is adequate funding to implement the conservation program of uh, the HCP. And then issuance of the ITP and the take to be authorized cannot result in jeopardy of the species or destruction or adverse modification of critical habitat. The service's issuance of an ITP is a federal action that triggers uh, consultation obligations under Section 7, compliance with NEPA, and other relevant statutes such as Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. Um, with respect to Section 7, the service consults with itself to determine whether or not that um, if permit issuance will, will result in jeopardy, um, and they will, just like any other federal action, issue a biological opinion and incidental take statement. HCPs um, are published in the Federal Register for public comment, typically with a 30-day comment period, unless it's um, uh, of unusual scale um, and things like that. An HCP has to include an estimate of take, an analysis of the impacts of the take, minimization measures, mitigation measures, um, a description of your monitoring program, uh, you know, how are you going to uh, determine that you're in compliance with your take cap, um, effectiveness monitoring of your minimization and mitigation, adaptive management provisions, you know, how are you um, based on your monitoring results going to kind of modify your program um, to ensure that your, the goals and, and requirements of your HCP are met, and then obviously financial assurances, how are you going to pay for the conservation program. Um, very briefly, Section uh, 10 uh, requires the services, I'm sorry, under a Section 10 permit, uh, you would include something called change circumstances or unforeseen circumstances. These are things that could happen, a change in circumstances affecting either the species or the geographic area in which your permit is operating that you can reasonably anticipate um, and address ahead of time. And so if, if a change circumstance happens, you would implement the measures you identified at the outset um, and would not be required to provide additional funding, um, compensatory mitigation, et cetera. Unforeseen circumstances are similar, except these would be circumstances that you couldn't anticipate ahead of time and were not written in um, to your HCP. Um, and just like with change circumstances, if this occurs, uh, an applicant, or sorry, the permittee would work with the service to try to find a way um, kind of within the bounds of the HCP um, to address the unforeseen circumstances, but cannot under any circumstance um, be required to, to put more money or land um, into the permit. Um, what I just described is, is referred to as no surprises. If unforeseen circumstances arise, the services will not require the commitment of additional land, water, or financial compensation. And the services honor those assurances so long as the permittee is implementing the terms and conditions of the HCP and permit. So from a practical perspective, Section 10 is an applicant-driven process. Again, it's voluntary to apply in the first place. Um, and the service is required, uh, you know, they shall issue an ITP if the statutory criteria are met. Um, However, um, it, it has been my experience kind of across the board that coordinating, um, working with the service um, to develop an HCP and actually get it all the way through the process can be quite lengthy and complicated. Um, it takes often very many years, um, typically one to two for a project specific HCP, often you know, three to five for a programmatic. And I've even seen a project specific permit application take 10 years to wind its way through the process. Um, there was some helpful guidance in April 2018 um, that describes when it is appropriate or when an agency, uh, sorry, when an applicant would seek an ITP, um, it clarifies that decision is on the applicant. It's the applicant's decision which species to cover. Um, and it's based on an applicant's own risk assessment of whether take is re reasonably certain to occur. Um, that same guidance actually provides some pretty helpful um, additional guidance on you know, when one could expect habitat modification to actually arise to the, to the level of take. Um, so that's a good, uh, good source to grab. Um, an HCP is final agency action subject to challenge um, under the Administrative Procedure Act and the ESA. We do see challenges to HCPs from time to time. Um, and um, I'll talk about some of those in just a second if we do have time. Um, 
In April 2024, the service published updates to its Section 10 regulations and, and introduced a number of provisions intended to make the process more efficient. Um, the guidance, I'm sorry, the regulations were primarily aimed at updating what is known as, known as enhancement of survival permits, which I'll cover in a moment, but it does make some important clarifications for HCPs, including that HCPs um, can be um, developed and incidental take permits issued for species that are not listed um, as endangered or threatened under the endangered species list. They clarify uh, when an applicant should get an HCP or ITP instead of seeking an enhancement of survival permit. Um, and in my view, sort of unhelpfully, they also included a provision um, that the US Fish and Wildlife Service's determination that an application is complete is a required step um, in the incidental take permit application process. And the reason I, I say that's somewhat unhelpful is, is often what we see um, in the HCP negotiation process is that um, if an applicant is not willing to include a particular provision um, or is unwilling to provide a particular kind of mitigation, um, a, a field office might say, well, we're not gonna process the application because it's not complete until you add this particular provision. So it kind of, um, it provides, it adds a layer of, of complexity. Um, so the Buckeye Wind Energy Project, um, very quickly, um, this was an HCP prepared to cover a 250 megawatt wind energy facility, um, estimating take at 5.2 Indiana bats per year over the 30 year life of the permit or 130 bats over that same term. Um, plaintiffs in that case uh, challenged the HCP and said, um, you didn't the service didn't require demonstration that the maximum extent practicable standard would be met because the applicant should have had to avoid all impacts first, minimized any impacts remaining, and then provided compensatory mitigation for any impacts remaining after avoidance and minimization. Um, the DC Circuit Court upheld the um, Endangered Species Act related analysis for that HCP saying that mitigation sequencing or mitigation hierarchy is not a requirement and that the circuit court also noted that if a, an HCP's uh, conservation program fully offsets take um, that's authorized under the ITP, um, that the maximum extent practicable standard should automatically um, be deemed met. Um, the DC circuit court actually did overturn that incidental take permit on the basis of um, a NEPA violation, uh, indicating that the service should have examined additional alternatives um, besides just the applicants or you know, proposed alternative and then a no permit alternative. Um, and for that reason, they had to redo their NEPA analysis. Enhancement of survival permits. And um, this is a different section of um, section 10. This is 10A1A. Um, under this section, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, can issue permits um, for scientific purposes or to enhance the propagation or survival of affected species. Um, previous to the Section 10 updates, uh, Section 10 regulation updates uh, from this year, the service had two programs under its enhancement of survival permits that could be relevant to project proponents. Those were candidate conservation agreements with assurances and safe harbor agreements. Um, Updates to Section 10 regulations combine these programs into one conservation benefit agreement. Um, this conservation benefit agreement, kind of like an HCP, you provide um, you know, lots of detail about your program and uh, what your conservation program is going to look like. While the standard for incidental take permits is you have to demonstrate you've minimized and mitigated um, impacts to listed species to the maximum extent practicable. For a CDA um, or an enhancement of survival permit, you have to demonstrate that your program will actually provide a net conservation benefit to the covered species. Um, a CDA can cover activities where a species is listed and you're undertaking an activity that could attract that species to your project or where a species is not yet listed and regulatory assurances are desirable for your conservation program. Uh, for example, you're going to, you want to attract pollinators by growing some, but you're going to have to to mow um, in order to kind of keep that habitat um, ideal. And when you mow, you might actually destroy um, eggs, et cetera. So under a, through a, a CBA, 
The permittee retains the right to discontinue the conservation measures and return its uh, property to baseline condition, at which point take authorization would conclude. Um, also, if you've covered non-listed species and those species are listed after the approval of your CBA, uh, then take authorization uh, kicks in so long as the permittee continues to implement the agreed upon conservation measures. Um, an EOS permit um, example is uh, the programmatic Monarch CCAA for renewable energy and transportation facilities. Um, under that CCAA, it was developed by a number of renewable energy companies, state departments of transportation, and the University of Illinois Chicago. Um, the plan is administered by UIC, and under the plan, companies and transportation entities can voluntarily enroll via um, certificates of inclusion, and through those certificates of inclusion, the entities agree to undertake certain habitat management activities, um, plantings, et cetera, and in exchange, those entities are allowed to continue to manage and operate um, rights of way and projects. Doesn't really allow like development of a completely new site, but it would allow for, for some activities to you know, upgrade facilities, et cetera. Um, it also provides take for the take authorization for the monarch should that species be listed uh, for anyone who's enrolled in the plan prior to listing. Okay, rounding, rounding up our ESA conversation, um, very briefly, there are penalties for non-compliance. So there are penalties for violations of section nine. Um, and there's also opportunities for citizens to bring suits under section 11. Um, the ESA provides for both civil and criminal penalties, um, fines and jail time, and allows for third parties with adequate notice to sue the US Fish and Wildlife Service, NIMPS, or a third party on the grounds that uh, the ESA is being violated or is imminently going to be violated. Um, citizens can also sue the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to enforce the ESA or to allege that a private party has violated or will violate Section 9. Um, if a third party is going to sue the service um, or, you know, a, an entity alleged to be in violation of the ESA, 60-day advance notice is required prior to following filing a lawsuit. Um, and if that notice is not filed, then the court uh, will not have jurisdiction over that suit. Um, these are two examples of um, some Section 11 lawsuits. Um, Beach Ridge Wind Energy Facility um, was a, a wind project undergoing construction that um, determined it did not uh, need to apply for an incidental take permit. Um, some a third party disagreed, challenged uh, the construction of that lawsuit, and ultimately a court um, based on some expert testimony that um, an endangered bat would be in the area and could be hit by the turbines uh, when it wasn't hibernating, a, a court enjoined construction of that, the completion of construction of that project until the project uh, obtained an incidental take permit. Um, and then Oregon California Trails Association, this is, uh, this was an HCP um, for about a 225 uh, mile transmission line. Um, and they did obtain an HCP for take of American bearing beetle, um, but project opponents believe that uh, endangered whooping cranes would hit the transmission lines and also um, would be affected by some wind energy projects that the transmission line was serving. Um, there were challenges to the project based on the Endangered Species Act, uh, NEPA, and the National Historic Preservation Act, and ultimately uh, district court in Colorado um, overturned uh, the incidental take permit and NEPA document. Um, it's kind of a convoluted opinion, but it ultimately, while the court said the US Fish and Wildlife Service was the expert agency and in, a, in a battle, an epic battle of the experts between the service and the plaintiff, the service is the expert agency uh, is going uh, to prevail so long as their decision is reasonable, which the court believed it was. Um, however, um, the court believed that it was improper that the HCP and NEPA document did not uh, fully consider the impacts of wind farms that would be served by the transmission line. And for that reason, um, that incidental tape permit um, was kicked back to the agencies. So that's all I have, and I will turn it back to Mindy. Thank you so much, Rebecca. That was great information, and you've generated a lot of really good questions from our audience. Um, and I see that we do have several hands raised. So if you have a question, make sure that you drop it in the Q&A or um, the webinar chat and I'll, I'll pull that out. 
And with that, I wanna make sure that we've got time for um, Katie Renshaw, who maybe has control of her slides. <laughs> Working on that okay. now. I just requested remote control. Excellent. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, as you have now heard, some uh, introductory overview material on both NEPA and the ESA. For my portion, the third portion of the seminar, I wanted to share with you all the type of conversations and issues that we at the federal agencies are currently grappling with. Although always subject to litigation and some degree of controversy, the last several years have involved an unprecedented level of scrutiny and rethinking of how agencies implement these key mandates. So as you heard in the introduction, my professional focus at NOAA is with NEPA. So NEPA will be really centered in this presentation, but as I'll quickly explain, NEPA is a really useful entry point to broader conversations about the landscape of environmental review and permitting. So my goal for you all following this discussion, you'll see that what I'm kind of going over in this overview, is that you have a better understanding of what permitting reform looks like at a federal agency and the impact of that reform on NEPA and where these reform efforts may be moving going forward. Okay. So Jamie introduced this concept of NEPA as an umbrella, you see my umbrella there, um, and explained that NEPA is not permitting. And I completely agree with that framing, but I wanted to dig in a little bit deeper about why these things keep getting conflated in the news, why NEPA reform is often synonymous with permitting reform. So as Jamie said, uh, projects subject to NEPA are often undergoing concurrent review processes under different statutory authorities, sometimes by different federal agencies all at the same time. Because NEPA is requiring agencies to evaluate the impacts of a proposed action and alternatives, that analysis creates a really helpful structure and a common set of facts to evaluate actions that can be used across those multiple statutory processes. So I've listed as an example here, it's an offshore wind project that's in the middle of the NEPA process right now. The uh, FEIS, the Final Environmental Impact Statement for the Atlantic Shores South project was just published a couple of weeks ago. The record of decision is expected in a couple of weeks from now, July 1st is the target date. These bullets here are everything that is going on right now at the federal agencies, in addition to NEPA analyzing and authorizing this project. Um, I'll note also that that framework of NEPA as an umbrella, it's not just for EISs, even environmental assessments and to some degree categorical exclusions can help create a structure and tease out the need and type of information that are used for other regulatory processes. So with that kind of introduction, why I might talk about NEPA and permitting a little bit concurrently, I wanna talk, to, talk about what are some recent reforms that have been going on. So I'm gonna start not in the NEPA world, with the Title 41 of the Fixing America Surface Transportation Act. This is commonly referred to as FAST 41. I think it's a really useful starting point to think about the current atmosphere today around environmental review and permitting. Um, for those not familiar with the act, it was enacted in 2015. It has a limited application to a set of enumerated infrastructure sectors, such as renewable energy, pipeline, transmission, and broadband. To be covered by this statute, a project sponsor needs to opt in to say, I want to be covered by FAST 41. And their project has to meet certain criteria which are designed to limit the statute to really large and complex projects. The key goals for this bipartisan legislation were one, increasing coordination among agencies. Although the statute doesn't change any of the underlying statutes that are applied to projects or any agency's authority, it does require agencies to come together at the start of a project to develop a coordinated project plan, in which the agencies work together under the leadership of the lead federal agency to negotiate a shared schedule for reviews and authorizations. This brings all of the agencies together to really drill down on the interdependencies between the different statutes and processes and work out how to complete those review processes concurrently. A second major goal is transparency. As you heard from um, Jamie earlier, there's a lot of opacity around what agencies are doing under NEPA and generally the environmental review and permitting process. So this is a screenshot of what's called the permitting dashboard, which was, which was introduced by this statute. And it is intended to provide a snapshot of the status of all interlocking environmental reviews and authorizations. This is, this is an older project, you can see it was completed in uh, 2023, but it's also an offshore wind project. And this is designed to kind of address that common criticism that agency work is in a black box. 
um, a view where you know applicants would submit a permitting application to an agency and then just sit and wait and not know where things stood. So by taking that coordinated project plan that the agencies negotiate and publishing the schedule and gives kind of a near real-time glimpse of where the agencies are in the process. So this dashboard allows both project sponsors and the public to track what's going on. Um, so I, I recommend if you wanna poke around, I include a link to the dashboard later in my presentation. But as I said, nothing in this statute, although this was in the guise of reform, those are two kind of noble goals about improving the interagency process, nothing in the statute amended NEPA or any underlying statutes. So what's going on with NEPA? So as you can see from this timeline and you heard from uh, Jamie's presentation, uh, NEPA is one of the oldest environmental statutes. It was enacted in 1969, uh, 1978. The Council on Environmental Quality first issued their the, kind of what we use, refer to as the, the 1978 regulations, the major regulatory interpretation of NEPA. From 1978 to 2020, although there was always some level of, you know, litigation informing agency NEPA practice and CEQ would issue periodic guidance, the regulations and statute were largely stable and untouched. So then I'll show you what's been going on. The last four years, however, have been a time of tremendous change. And I'm going to walk through each of these developments in, in my next several slides. So in 2020, with the stated goal of comprehensively updating, modernizing, and clarifying the NEPA regulations to facilitate more efficient, effective, and timely reviews by agencies, uh, the Trump administration issued a rule that did a major overhaul of the CEQ NEPA regulations. If you look at a red line version of the regulations compared 1978 to 2020, there were changes throughout the entire set of regulations. Um, a couple of key things that were highlighted that I'm gonna highlight here are it introduced timelines for NEPA reviews. As Jamie pointed out, there has been a lot of criticism and concern about how long it takes agencies to complete a NEPA analysis. So the CEQ introduced mandatory timelines for those reviews. For environmental impact statements, the timeline was set at two years, starting from the notice of intent to prepare an environmental impact statement to the record of decision. Um, again, compare that to that four and a half-ish years on average. So that's a major shortening of the timeline for an EIS. And then one year for an environmental assessment from the decision to prepare an EA to the finalization of an EA. Uh, another common complaint or criticism of uh, environmental analysis under NEPA is how voluminous those documents are. Because there's been so much uh, litigation around NEPA and agencies, although the percentage of projects that are litigated is small, there is often a threat of litigation that has led to kind of an expansion and swelling of NEPA documents. So the former administration issued page limits, hard page limits for those NEPA documents for environmental impact statements. Uh, the typical page limit was set at 150 pages with the allowance to go up to 300 for a more complex project. I'll say the average is, it's not on common for an EIS prior to these page limits to be closer to 1,000 pages. And for environmental assessments, a page limit of uh, 75 pages. Notably, there was deletion of language around the requirement to evaluate cumulative effects of actions and alternatives. There are also, as I said, there are a number of other provisions. A couple of them I'll highlight are provisions to limit judicial review and some strict requirements of pu public engagement, what is expected in a comment to be submitted. They also codified uh, an idea called one federal decision which is a requirement when more than one agency have their own NEPA obligation around the same action, hearkening back to that um, offshore wind example. For example, uh, the lead agency for an offshore wind project is the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, who is evaluating a project under the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act. So they are preparing a NEPA document. The My clients, the National Marine Fishery Service within NOAA, um, are evaluating whether to issue uh, take authorization under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, which has a NEPA obligation. So we have to prepare a NEPA document. And the Army Corps has several permits to issue and they have a NEPA obligation. What this one federal decision concept requires is that for all of those agencies, they must use the same NEPA document, work together as lead and cooperating agencies to prepare a single NEPA document that's used by all of them with a single where possible record of decision. So these regulations went into effect in September of 2020. However, on January 20th, 2021, day one of the Biden-Harris administration, 
through executive order, the administration signaled they intended to review these regulations along with the ESA regulations that had been issued under the prior administration and a handful of other environmental regulations. So while they've been in effect, if you think back to Jamie's uh, diagram of the tiered implementation, very few agencies have gone through um, and updated their internal procedures to implement these uh, regulations. So the Biden-Harris administration said they were going to start re-evaluating the regulations, and they decided to do this in a stepwise fashion. So on January, on April 20th, 2022, CEQ took the first step by finalizing phase one of the revisions to the 2020 regulations. Um, they have targeted a, a very limited scope here. This was a key provisions that CEQ determined posed a significant near-term interpretation or implementation challenge for federal agencies and that they knew for sure they were going to modify. So the three provisions that were impacted and changed on April 20th of 2022 was a modification to purpose and need requirements and related reasonable alternatives provisions from that apply to environmental impact statements. The 2020 regulations had um, put in a more central role the purpose and need of a project sponsor or an applicant versus maybe the federal agency's purpose and need in action. And so CEQ said, no, it's actually the, the federal agency's purpose and need that should be driving the scope of analysis. So those were changed. Second was a restoration of flexibility for agency procedures. The 2020 regulations had put basically a ceiling on agency procedures saying that um, agencies can be no more protective than the CEQ regulations in their own procedures. And in the phase one rule, CEQ removed that ceiling. And finally, and notably, that language that had uh, eliminated cumulative effects, all of the cumulative effects language was restored back into the regulations. So CEQ was working away. They'd finalized phase one, and they were deep into the process of putting together a more comprehensive phase two notice of proposed rulemaking. In fact, the agency, CEQ, had already started the interagency review process for that rule when in June of last year, Congress passed the Fiscal Responsibility Act of 2023, which made several key changes to the NEPA statute itself. If you missed this bill last year, you weren't paying attention, this was part of the bipartisan deal to raise the debt ceiling. And within that act of Congress and in the spirit of permitting reform, uh, Congress locked in several aspects of the 2020 regulations and went even further in some, um, and went further in some areas. Key provisions include codifying those timelines, that two-year and one-year timeline, uh, codifying the page limits, and that one federal decision requirement. Those are all now features of NEPA itself. Several of the provisions um, are also changes to the statute, but are reflective of current NEPA practice. For example, that I think Jamie had mentioned had come out of case law. So for example, the requirement that only reasonable alternatives be analyzed, that only re reasonably foreseeable impacts are evaluated. There are also new provisions related to programmatic review, uh, how to use uh, programmatic environmental impact statements and programmatic environmental assessments, um, how to borrow categorical exclusions from another agency. And there was an introduction of new definitions, one key one being that of a major federal action, which could reduce the scope of actions subject to NEPA. Okay, so then CQ went quickly back to the drawing board, modified phase two that was in process, and uh, so that they could get all of that in, in addition to their comprehensive reevaluation of the NEPA regulations. So this rule, phase two, which is also known as the Bipartisan Permitting Reform Implementation Rule, was published on May 1st of 2024, just last month. It will go into effect on July 1st of this year. I'm going to talk about some of the provisions in buckets. I will say there, um, you, we could spend two hours walking through this rule, and there's great information available on CEQ's website on NEPA.gov that really breaks down everything that is in this regular rulemaking. So if you want to learn more, I really encourage you to pull up some of that material. So there are a host of provisions intended to implement those Fiscal Responsibility Act NEPA amendments. For example, how do agencies actually implement these deadlines? How do you change a deadline, you know, if you need to? Um, what are the roles? How does a, what is a role for a lead agency and a cooperating agency? How do we do more information on programmatic environmental reviews, the mechanics of adopting other agencies' categorical exclusions or borrowing categorical exclusions? Um, how to analyze the adverse effects of no action alternatives and things like that. 
There are a bucket of measures intended to improve efficiency and effectiveness of environmental reviews. Um, CEQ's created more flexibilities in the way to establish an agency's categorical exclusion for the first time. Um, how to do the mechanics of tiering, how to rely on a for an existing environmental review. Supplementation, this is something that agencies do routinely if a uh, review has been in place for a while and there's ongoing act, how to go back and supplement that review. Um, adoption broadly, um, some of the issues like mitigated FONSIs that Jamie talked about, there's more regulatory provisions around that. Um, and transparency. So there's, as I said here, there's a bucket of things about public engagement, transparency, and environmental justice. Um, I saw several questions in the chat in the Q&A about, you know, how to learn more about agency NEPA practice. Well, hopefully, well, we'll see uh, new requirements under the regulations are requiring agencies to actually have publicly available information about their ongoing environmental impact statements, ongoing environmental assessments, and how to reach and archive all of those older EISs and EAs. So hopefully there'll be more data about agency practice going forward. Um, there's an introduction of terms, more things that are, you know, required to be analyzed under NEPA, such as climate change, um, and telling agencies to quantify the uh, greenhouse gas impacts when available. Um, introducing the term environmental justice and explaining what um, agencies' obligations are to consider impacts to environmental justice communities. Uh, agencies are now required to designate a chief public engagement officer to ensure that agencies are communicating fulsomely and transparently with the public about ongoing NEPA Act. And there was a removal of certain provisions from the 2020 regulations, such as those intended to limit judicial review and things of that nature. So I just blitz through a bunch of major actions about what is being pushed on on permitting reform. So I wanted to tease out what I see as the major shared themes on what agencies are trying to, or kind of been instructed our marching orders to try to do and where, do, where is this gonna go? So efficiency is a word we've heard a lot. How do we do actions simultaneously rather than sequentially rather than possible? What are pragmatic limitations on the scope of analysis that keep it from uh, mushrooming or ballooning without harming the kind of core environmental analysis and protections? Um, an encouragement to use the lowest tier of documents necessary and possible. You know, if an action is appropriately covered by a, a categorical exclusion, to use a CE versus an environmental assessment or to use an environmental assessment versus an EIS, et cetera. Transparency, transparency is a huge goal how to um, increase that accessibility of information about ongoing NEPA reviews, agency NEPA procedures and information needs and other processes, and to have that accountability for delays. If things are not going as quickly, why? So we can understand and make improvements going forward. Uh, there are a lot of push on the quality of documents in the analysis, uh, both the Fiscal Responsibility Act amendments and phase two rule have standards about the scientific integrity and the quality of the information that are underlying agency analyses and the need to verify the continued viability of documents through the supplementation requirements, verifying that a programmatic document is still valid after five years, things like that. And then what I'm broadly calling modernization, both technological modernization, you know, when NEPA was enacted in 1969 and when the regulations were put in place in 1978, the way agencies did NEPA and did analysis was paper. Um, permit applications are paper. We are not in that era anymore. So there's a need to kind of bring our practice into alignment with where we are in time. But moderners also, modernization also means bringing in those other issues that we're not forefront, such as climate change and environmental justice, the major, the, you know, the noble goal of bringing the agencies into the 21st century. And finally, coordination. How can agencies work together collaboratively? A lot of work has gone into defining um, the relationship between cooperating agency and lead agencies, um, bringing in a broader play, uh, host of players, states as cooperating agencies, bringing tribes into the process. Uh, one federal decision, shared timelines, all of that has really uh, been an area of emphasis for the agencies. So what's, what's next? So I'm going to close by talking about where things might be moving forward with both the implementation of phase two and future horizons for NEPA and permitting reform. Uh, generally speaking, I'll note that further modifications to the NEPA statute are not outside of the realm of the possible. We can, there continue to be proposals of additional reforms, but we will see what happens. 
And of course, if there is a change of administration um, after the election this year, a different CEQ may want to revisit the regulations that were just finalized. We may be doing another iteration again. This is a really, um, it's a fun time for NEPA nerds. If there's any law students who are looking for areas to research, there is a ton of federal agency actioning happening right now in the NEPA space. Every federal agency has one year from the July 1st, 2024 implement, um, effective date of the phase two NEPA regulations to propose revised NEPA procedures to the, the White House Council on Environmental Quality. So you can anticipate seeing a flurry of proposed revised agency procedures over the next few years. And even now we're starting to see agencies working on implementing the CE borrowing authority that the Fiscal Responsibility Act gave to agencies. There have been countless um, examples of agencies uh, saying, you know, I like that categorical exclusion that this agency has. I wanna bring it into my agency. Beyond those kind of strict implementation actions, I wanted to highlight a few areas where there are, I think, kind of interesting and exciting ongoing conversations around NEPA. The first I'll broadly call an emphasis on digitization, modernization, and e-NEPA. As I mentioned on the last slide, this has been an area of ongoing focus, but two specific examples I wanted to call out come from the Department of Transportation and the White House Council on Environmental Quality. First, um, I wanted to flag the Department of Transportation recently launched a modernizing NEPA challenge. DOT is working to encourage the use of web-based interactive platforms to make deep NEPA documents more accessible and transparent to the public, reviewing agencies and historically underrepresented populations. They're also working to incentivize collaborative real-time reviews and to save time and improve the quality of NEPA documents. This challenge is ongoing. It's open until next month. They're looking for kind of project sponsors, uh, contractors kind of come up with interesting ideas for DOT to think about how they can modernize uh, implementation of NEPA. Second is another section of the Fiscal Responsibility Act, section 110, um, where Congress directed CEQ to conduct a study and submit a report to Congress on potential for online and digital technologies to address delays in reviews and improve public and access in, uh, transparency in NEPA, including, but not limited to a unified permitting portal. We're expecting that, pro uh, that uh, report to come out imminently. Um, and meanwhile, as part of this kind of mandate to think about um, technology and, and NEPA, CEQ has stood up an interagency working group specific to technology. So agencies can share with each other what tools they've used, how are they tracking their ongoing processes, are they finding ways to um, bring technology into the NEPA practice. And so in addition to these technology-based innovations, um, agencies are continuing to find ways to enhance interagency partnerships and collaboration. Um, the first example I've highlighted is a bit of a combination of these two themes. It's uh, Department of Energy's Coordinated Interagency Transmission Authorizations and Permits Program, or their SITAP program. It's an interagency working group led by Department of Energy and an example of a digital platform for collaboration. So the Department of Energy is tasked their lead agency for certain transmission projects, and which is the type of project that is incredibly complicated from a permitting standpoint. If you think about everything, this is primarily land-based um, transmission um, in terms of land authorization and the consultations under things like the Endangered Species Act, National Historic Preservation Act. So it's one of those great examples of a mishmash of a lot of combined federal authorities and actions. So DOE has created a program where the agencies are working together to identify what the information needs are to permit a project under this in this program, a portal for project proponents to be able to submit everything in, uh, electronically into one place and for agencies to be able to use it as a collaborative workspace. So it's a really exciting example of kind of bringing technology in and having those kind of early conversations and collaborations amongst the agencies. Uh, second example is what BOEM, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management is doing to kind of uh, address information needs for offshore wind projects. So they recently issued a notice of intent checklist, which is for project proponents. They understand what information, what are the types of studies, what do they need to do to be ready to start the NEPA process? This was developed in close collaboration with all the agencies, including NOAA, so that everyone's needs were met. So that hopefully once, you know, everything has gone through that checklist, agents can actually make those really aggressive two-year timelines. And then I recognize we're running low on time, but there's so really interesting, a lot of tremendous interest and opportunity in exploring use of artificial intelligence and machine learning in the NEPA context. So as 
uh, more NEA and more NEPA documents are going to start living in the digital space. Uh, different organizations are doing exploration of how they can use machine learning to call out that common information, find information about affected environments, species, both to inform um, project applicants so they can, before they start and put their application together, what they can draw from existing NEPA documents, and even to help agencies. I know I'm personally really interested in the idea of how to use AI to manage um, responses to significant volumes of comments. You know, if you're getting tens of thousand comments on a document, how can AI help the agency kind of put that together and organize responses? So a lot of really interesting things are gonna be happening over the next couple of years. Um, so you know, watch the space. So I, ooh, my, I lost my slides, but the last slide here was just a couple of useful resources. I mentioned both during the course of the presentation, um, but nepa.gov and permits.performance.gov. I, I encourage you if you wanna learn more about any of these topics, there's a lot of great resources there. So thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, while we wait for our other panelists to hop back online, I want to note that we got some really great audience questions and we have participants from all over the world. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, it seems like some of you are definitely ready to move on to the two and 300 level NEPA and ESA classes. Uh, so while we won't have time to address all of your questions, I tried to pull some that are uh, representative samples of some of the questions that we got. So we've only got 10 minutes left, let's get right into it. Um, I'd like to start with a question for both Rebecca and for Katie. Uh, over the last several decades, we've seen an increase in what we are thinking of sort of a whiplashing of regulations implementing both NEPA and the ESA every time we have an administration turnover, which is a challenge for regulated industries as well as for the federal agencies themselves that are having to implement these statutes. So Rebecca referenced several regulatory actions, uh, such as changes in the Fish and Wildlife Service's approach to the 4D rules, issuance and rescission of the definition of habitat, uh, revisions to Section 7 consultation um, that have changed from one administration to the next and back. And then Katie just noted that the 2020 NEPA regs were pulled back only months after they were finalized. So um, Rebecca, can you speak to some of the challenges that attorneys like us in private practice have in advising clients um, who are in these regulated industries on compliance with these statutes um, when they change drastically uh, every few years? Sure, um, that's a great question. I, I would maybe pull it back just a little bit and say that I have found that overall, um, not across the board, but overall, um, a lot of the changes we've seen um, from 2020 and even to now have largely been implementing common practices um, that the agencies were already undertaking. Um, I think that's especially true for NEPA. Um, I think it got a lot of press um, kind of on all sides, but from a practitioner's perspective, I didn't find a lot of either of the sets of regulations to be um, terribly different, um, maybe with a couple of, of exceptions. And with respect to the ESA, um, you know, we thought the 4D rule might be kind of, you know, re-implementing the 4D rule or pulling back the 4D rule might be a big deal. But in reality, um, when the service rescinded that blanket 4D rule, um, every single species it listed as threatened after that, um, they issued a species specific rule. So it ended up functioning very much the same. Um, you know, some of the some of the issues that we've seen um, kind of relate to these shifts in um, policy um, that have ended up being codified, like requiring mitigation um, in Section Seven. As a practitioner, though, that was an area that we sometimes could get the agency to back off a bit and say, you know, you're not really under the statute, your own regulations or your policies, able to require mitigation, and now we don't really have that as a fallback. Um, anyway, so I don't know if that's helpful for anyone. Yes, thanks. And, and Katie, I'd like you to address it from the agency perspective. How do you go about providing durable guidance to these regulated industries when you're dealing with these shifts in policy and regulatory changes? Yeah, and honestly, a lot of our challenges is uh, advice to my clients, to our program, who are wondering, you know, what rules of the road should we be applying? So we have been, you know, agencies do have NEPA and blending procedures, but as I said, it's that's a lengthy process to revise those procedures. So it's, it's hard to commit to making that res, you know, uh, revision uh, when it might get changed again. But what we've been doing is doing a lot of interim guidance where, again, consistent with Rebecca said, a lot of um, the changes are consistent with practice. So there's a lot of explanation of, you know, this may say this, but this is what you should do, or this is how this tracks with our current, you know, um, implementing procedures and not. So we've just had to be very facile and 
issue, a, we're working on our newest interim guidance uh, for our practitioners that'll come out before July 1st. It's just something we've had to do constantly is kind of re-educate a lot of um, teaching folks about what is in the rules, what are myths, what are not. Um, and that, but then also for some of the things that are action forcing, like the timelines and page limits, we've had to create new structures and uh, internal administrative procedures to make it work. What can be challenging is working with other agencies and ensuring consistent interpretation and implementation of these regulations. I think that's true in the ESA space as well as the NEPA space as they're changing. So there is a lot of need for leadership from White House Council on Environmental Quality and agencies working together to make sure we're not going in different directions. Great, thank you. Uh, here's one that would be good for Jamie and Katie. Um, in recent years, we've seen an enormous influx of federal funding for these energy infrastructure projects through both the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act. And many of these projects will be subject to NEPA review. Um, so I'd like to get your thoughts on what would be the most impactful provisions of the new NEPA implementing regs that you think will be helpful for facilitating these energy infrastructure projects. Uh, I guess I could start. Um, I think that two uh, things that could be quite interesting. One is that there was an infusion of funding, which I think is going to be extremely useful. Um, as I mentioned, one of the large, probably the most consistent thing that we saw in our research in terms of delays in a project is a lack of agency capacity. That is unstable budgets. It's uh, lack of enough people with the right expertise to be able to do work or just not enough people to um, be able to manage applications. So I think funding is enormous. And I think what's most important is making sure that the funding and the support for agency capacity is sustained. Because uh, it's one thing to do a singular infusion, but if it doesn't, if it's not sustained, uh, it can't be relied upon. It can't create long-term efficiencies. Um, something else that I'm interested in watching is that uh, a lot of research, especially on renewable projects, has shown that community opposition is really one of the largest sources of delays, particularly where projects are interfacing not only with federal regulatory requirements, but also local zoning uh, requirements. And in that regard, I think that the NEPA process and the transparent federal procedures that are available through it really have the possibility of creating community um, an, an opportunity to engage with the community early and even earlier in the project uh, the the project process. So it's watching how that develops could be really interesting. Rebecca. I think that one was over to Katie. <laughs> sure, I will say I definitely agree. I know we've been able to take advantage of some of the funding, not just directly for our agency, but through the permitting council received a significant infusion of resources that they were able to distribute the agencies to enhance permitting. Um, some of which I think has been really interesting because it's gone not just to our the staff who are doing the regulatory reviews and permitting, but also to support uh, work on, you know, better siting and better understanding, you know, where to place projects, which can get at some of that local opposition you're talking about, Jamie. So really looking, broadening the scope of what's necessary to make permitting work faster, not just people writing things, but making better decisions. So I totally agree. Great, thank you. I think we've got time for one more, and this is sort of a fun question for Jamie and Rebecca. Um, you both noted that lawsuits are a key component in the ultimate implementation of both NEPA and the ESA. Um, but I'd let you offer a, a few more thoughts on this, including whether you think this has been a, a positive or negative outcome um, of using the judicial review and citizen suit provisions of these statutes. And I'll note there was a question about how do environmental NGOs use these lawsuits to raise money? I'm not asking you to touch that one. That seems like a, a lightning rod we don't need to get into today. but but it is an interesting question. Uh, uh, first, Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, I think it's, it is important for um, folks to be able to challenge agency decisions or, or the lack of decision-making. I think from a listing perspective, um, 
that's tricky um, because so many of the services listing decisions are driven by these very large settlement agreements um, made between ENGOs and the service. Um, and the reality is, and this was alluded to by Jamie and Katie, um, agencies are just underfunded. Um, they don't have the staff to really be able to get through this, this long backlog. And so sometimes because of the settlement, um, you know, you might have the agency focusing on a set of species that was really important to that particular entity, um, even though there may be other species, um, you know, that, that need to be looked at as well. Um, so, you know, important to be able to um, encourage the service to make its decisions and meet its deadlines, but also can be um, draining on agency resources. Um, I'll stop there because I know we're very short on time. I think I agree with the I think the couple things I would add to that. Um, when we talk about litigation, uh, I think there there are two elements that are worth thinking about that we don't often talk about. One is um, there are I think that there is real real delay that's caused by fear of litigation. So um, a being afraid that a case will be litigated can cause an agency to move more slowly on a project or to request more information. And so I think that um, fear of avoiding litigation is a real risk of delay that probably isn't very productive. On the other hand, I think that uh, the risk of litigation also promotes more stringent compliance with uh, statutes and statutory requirements and the availability to access justice when there hasn't been compliance with the statute or maybe the compliance is not very rigorous is I think a really important element of achieving the goals of our environmental statutes that are there. Well, thank you good. all so much for joining us. Thank you, Mindy, for guiding this very brief discussion. I wish we had like another hour to get into all these questions. There were a lot of really smart questions in the chat and the Q&A, lots of discussion going on. Um, we couldn't be happier um, and with all of the presentations today. So thank you to Jamie, Rebecca, and Katie. Um, for sharing your expertise with us. We do have um, summer school every week at this time through the end of July. If you couldn't attend the full webinar today, um, we'll have a recording up on the event webpage, which is in the chat, and you can head over there and find all of the rest of our schedule. Next week, we'll be doing clean air and then clean water after that. So we're really excited to dive into some more statutes like today. Um, we hope to see you at our future programming, which you can find at eli.org. And with that, we'll close it out. So thank you, everybody, and have an amazing day. Bye, everyone. Thank you.